Yes. And I, so. I am going to share my screen for just a minute to um, to present quickly, uh, just to present the program, okay? Okay. Um, and uh, give me a second. And I think you, as soon as I do that, you can start, uh, Esteban. Esteban, please go ahead. All right. Um, well, so good morning, everyone. I want to welcome everybody for the final presentations of the 2020 uh, practicum projects. And these practicum projects are an essential part of uh, a broader um, initiative that we have uh, a partnership that we have between the Society and Health Research Center that I direct in Chile, uh, together with the Mayaman School of Public Health and the Columbia Global Center Santiago. Um, Karen, Chris, and, and maybe other uh, staff from the Columbia Global Center had another meeting at 10, so they told us to just begin and they will join at some point during the meeting. Uh, but this project that I'm referring to, this broader endeavor, uh, we call it the Building Healthy Society project. And it basically aims to expand the global engagement of faculty and students, uh, promoting international research collaboration between all the parties involved. And since 2018, we have been very active. Uh, we have supported 11 practicum students that work together with uh, students and faculty in Chile. Uh, we have published more than 30 scientific articles, leveraged more than $700,000 in research grants and disseminated activities through a number of seminars, uh, media coverage, and, and a lot of online social network, institutional websites, activities, right? And today, we, we have five Columbia students that will present their work. Uh, Ilana Middleman will be presenting her work on loneliness and social isolation in old age. Julian Ponce will be talking about healthy lifestyles among older adults. Alison Stewart will be talking about migration and substance use. And Christina Howell, who worked together with Thomas Wagner, uh, will present uh, their project on injury-related admissions to the ER. Uh, that followed the protests in Chile, the mobilizations that happened uh, in, in October. And well, I want to thank Rosario, Cynthia, and especially Anna for the dedication and support to this endeavor. None of these would have happened uh, without their help. And, and I also want to thank the, the faculty at CIS that sponsored uh, the practicum projects. Um, in these projects, interns had to apply what they have learned in the class to the field while learning how to work collaboratively in an international setting. What they didn't get this time uh, was to live in an international setting, right? Uh, and, and that was the, the big loss of, of the pandemic for this cohort of students. But I wanna celebrate these students because each of them exceeded our expectations. They displayed outstanding discipline, motivation, sensibility, and intellect. And, and, and you are exactly the kind of people that we want to have working in our research labs. So I, I want to tell you that, celebrate what you have done, and, and thank you a lot for your contributions. And thus, I also want to leave an invitation open for you to hopefully have another chance, a second chance to visit Chile once this pandemic is over. So continuing your practicum project as a thesis or capstone pro pro project may be a good excuse to make uh, this happen. And, and before beginning the presentations, I, I would like to invite uh, our associate dean of the Office of Field Practice, Linda Cushman, uh, to say a few words. So, uh, Dr. Cushman, I, I'll 
hand you the microphone now. <laughs> Thank you, Esteban. Uh, am I, I, okay, I'm not muted, which is an improvement on the way I often start. Hi, everyone. Um, I, am, I am just delighted to be here this morning. I, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm just full of gratitude for, 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 for all of you and for, for so many things about this project. You know, I've been directing field practice at the Mailman School for many years. And this is really just a gem of a collaboration that uh, Dr. Esteban Calvo, I, I really have to start with you. You approached us with this amazing idea about five years ago, I believe. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a wonderful idea and your faculty's willingness to be mentors, uh, your coordinator's willingness, uh, Rosario and Cynthia, uh, of course now, uh, just amazing. And um, you know, you, you don't always see that kind of excitement and dedication, but it's really been here in Chile uh, and, and Universidad Mayor, Research Center or for Society and Health has, has been invaluable. The whole thing has just been a wonderful experience for me as someone who's, who's, who's worked uh, you know, with, with international sites for, for a, a number of years. And um, I'm just really just want to say thank you to, to you, to all of you. Um, uh, I would like to, I don't think they're on the call, but the Chile Global Center has been involved, particularly Karen, I don't know if you're here. Uh, Tanya from Global Pop has, has had an important role. And oh my goodness, the students in Chile this year, Julian, Ilana, Alison, Cristina, Tomas, I, I can't tell you, you know, the word does get around. The word does get around. I'm really swamped right now. Some of you know that in addition to my field practice and prof pro professor role, I'm standing in at the moment as the uh, interim vice dean for education at the Melman School, but we're doing interviews. We're going to have a new vice dean very soon, I hope. But um, so I've been all over the map this summer, but the, the word travels fast when students work like you do and where students show a professionalism and a commitment and a dedication to the work like you have. And all of you, this whole remote thing, you know, for me, I'm just, I'm just amazed and astounded that we can do anything remotely, but you have, you know, the word has been that you could not have done a better job had you been able to be there. And I know that was all of your, your first wish and it was our first wish for you too, but we couldn't do that. But, you know, no matter, you just, you just, you know, stepped up to the plate and you've done an amazing job and you've made all of us, including me, very proud. So um, I am regrettably gonna be on the call only for a short time, but you all have practicum presentations to do once the school year starts. So I will get to hear more about each of these incredible projects. Um, let me close by thanking uh, the Director of Field Practice at Mailman, Anna Jimenez Bautista. Anna, clearly none of this without your collaboration with the team in Chile and with your collaboration with the students. Thank you so much to all of you. And uh, I'm going to turn it back, uh, Esteban, to you or to Anna or who, whoever is going to speak next. Thank you so much for having me here. It's truly a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, Linda. Um, Cynthia, do you, you have the program. Uh, so maybe you can uh, introduce the students in the order that you appear in the program. And you don't need to share the program, just mention. Yeah. Uh, we, talked the that, we, we talked at the beginning and we changed a little bit the, the, the order of the presentation. And Alison Stewart is going to start now with the presentation. There you are. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, so my practicum is a qualitative analysis on migration and substance use in Chile and Mexico. The practicum was broken down into two components. Um, so first I will be discussing the qualitative analysis on injection drug use among women in Tijuana, Mexico. And later I'll briefly talk about the second project on migration and COVID-19 in Chile. 
Tijuana is a border city just south of California. This is one of the busiest borders worldwide, and it's also a central node along one of the highest volume drug trafficking routes stretching from Central America through Mexico into the US. And so this has led to the, avail the availability of drugs as well as sustained migration from other Mexican regions, Central America, and from the US of both migrant returnees as a result of increased deportations, um, as well as people from the US crossing the border to Tijuana. There's also a high prevalence of HIV, which is concentrated among key populations of men who have sex with men, transgender women, female sex workers, and people who inject drugs. From existing literature on female injection drug users, we know that women are at an increased risk for HIV and STIs, dangerous injection behaviors, sexual abuse, and mortality. They are also more likely than men to be injected by someone else their first time, often by a male sexual partner. And injection drug use can be defined as a behavior that's influenced by interpersonal group and broader social processes or a socially communicable process. However, there's very limited information on injection initiation, um, referring to when a person is first injected, um, as well as injection patterns, partic particularly among women. And so my supervisor at Universidad Mayor, Teresita, um, in collaboration with colleagues um, at UCSD, conducted 30 in-depth interviews with female injection drug users in Tijuana. The participants were recruited through El Cuete, which is a longitudinal project that had been ongoing in Tijuana. And the interview covered the themes of injection initiation experiences, curtain patterns of injection drug use, places where they inject, protective strategies used to stay safe, health concerns, and potential harm reduction interventions. The interviews were all de-identified, transcribed, and translated into English. And then my practicum specifically focused on the next stage of inductive qualitative analysis using Deduce, which is an online software for qualitative um, data analysis. And the aim of this analysis was to identify those patterns of injection initiation and injection drug use among women. Teresita and I first worked together to create a code book, um, which would be used for the coding process. And this was an ongoing process of discussion and reviewing the field notes and interviews. Um, and so this is just a snapshot of a few of the, the, a few of the codes. You can see the main code or the family code, um, as well as subcodes and a description of when and how it would be used um, during the coding process. And through the process of um, discussion, it ended up going from six main codes to 13 main codes, as well as the subcodes and support codes. And so I then inputted this into the Deduce software, and here you can see an example of one of the interviews that I coded um, and how I attached various codes to each segment of the interview um, as part of the qualitative data analysis using an inductive perspective in which the data is used to um, craft broader conclusions or theories. And interestingly, one major theme that arose as I was going through this process of coding was that of gender differences. Um, and so I began to organize the findings and outline the manuscript based on gender related differences in injection drug use and the relationships between drug users. The project is still in progress. I'm currently working on organizing and drafting findings, and then we'll continue with writing the manuscript, which we plan to publish in either the Harm Reduction Journal or Global Public Health. This is an abstract that I also worked on, um, and I'm showing it here just to give you an idea of the direction that the paper will be going in. A couple key results are that more than half the participants in Tijuana, 63%, reported that they were initiated by a male injection drug user, often in the context of an intimate relationship. However, a majority of the participants, 80%, transitioned to become self-injectors in order to avoid risks, including overdose, violence, sexual abuse, and wounds associated with relying on others for injection. And the narratives of the participants elucidate the connection between interpersonal relationships and protective strategies used to avoid risks associated with injection drug use among women as well as highlight the need for harm reduction interventions targeted to female injection drug users. For example, a safe place where women can receive clean needles and teach each other to inject. Here are a few key quotes to give you an idea of the voices behind some of the interviews. So 
one woman said, I doubt others when they are going to inject me. I feel that if I can't do it, how is someone else going to? We are more vulnerable and we are at the mercy of men because men have the means to defend themselves. Us addicts are dead people in live bodies. And finally, I prefer to carry my own blame and not the blame of other people. So the second part of my practicum, which I'll discuss very briefly, um, was on migration and COVID-19 in Chile. So since the start of the pandemic, um, the migrant population has been facing various challenges, particularly related to the loss of work. And so I've been regularly monitoring um, news and key events um, and data and politics around the migrant situation and compiling the information in a database, which I'll be using to write a short report for a local newsletter or newspaper. Um, I've also helped Teresita to find and organize some data in preparation for a webinar um, through the University on Migration and COVID-19 that she led. And so here you can see some of the key issues that I found to be most prominent. Um, and the, issue, the images on the right are depicting the situation in which hundreds of migrants from neighboring countries such as Bolivia, Peru, Venezuela, were stranded um, in Chile and were waiting outside um, their embassies in Santiago um, since um, many of the borders had been closed um, and in an effort to contain the spread of the virus. And so thinking forward, it's important that um, we think about some long-term sustainable solutions to improve the integration of migrants into Chilean society in addition to the direct relief that was offered through various organizations. That concludes my presentation. Um, but I'm open to any questions and comments that you may have. Great. Does yeah. anyone have any questions? I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't really know your background on migration. I would like to hear a little more about that and how uh, the experience of these projects help you to build on that. Mm -hmm. um, well, in the past, I've worked for um, with a few different nonprofits in Latin America, so in Guatemala um, and Chile, doing some research in the past. Um, and that got me very interested in migration and perhaps working with Latino populations in the US. Um, so I think that this, doing this review definitely showed me that the situation is really complicated and there's a lot of different factors involved in helping the migrants there. Um, and especially thinking about people that are in more of an informal status versus a regular migratory status. Um, and I definitely would be interested in, it's a little difficult to, I guess, work with a migrant population from afar, but I think the next step would be to eventually go back to Chile and um, somehow do some community work and work with the migrant population there. That sounds great. Uh, thank you for your presentation and I hope you enjoy your virtual time in Chile. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for the presentation. I do not have a question, but I just have a general comment. If there is any brief comment that the supervisors, that the direct supervisors want to do after each of the presentations, you are welcome to. You do not have to, but you are very welcome to. Um, thank you. I would like to just mention that uh, Alison did a great job in analyzing the interviews. As you saw, the themes are very sensitive and I mean, not everyone is used to reading this type of information. And she was always asking about the context in Tijuana and she was really uh, contributing to add new codes. Um, I really enjoyed spending time with her every week. And I hope that we can keep collaborating and drafting the, the paper. Thank you, Alison. Great. Does anyone have any other question? I do have a huh? small question, maybe for Teresita or Alison. I don't know um, who translated. I mean, I'm interested in the process of translating this kind of sensitive 
data and like when I imagine they use um, words that are hard sometimes to translate, how do you kind of ensure that you are making the best in, in, in translating this information? Yeah, I did the translations because I did the interviews and sometimes it's hard to understand. Actually, Alison helped uh, translating one. Was it the one in English? Because we interviewed three participants from the US who were living in Tijuana and were using heroin there. Do you want to talk about your experience, Alison? <laughs> um, I did translate one interview um, and then transcribed one that was already in English. So. I didn't find it too difficult other than there's a few specific terms of places or um, I guess more like local terms for the community. So those, I think we tended to leave in Spanish. Oh, okay. And we, there is a glossary of terms because there are a lot of terms that heroin drug users use in Tijuana, like tecato is some, it's to refer to someone who uses heroin. Malilla is withdrawal syndrome. So we just put that, that word and it practice the, the definition. Okay. Thank you for the presentation, Alison. Yeah. Alvaro. Alvaro, you want to? Well, yeah, my, my question was basically the same that Rosario said. I think that probably the cost of translating the interviews if will not be too much if depending on the type of analysis you're doing if you're more doing a content analysis maybe it's not necessarily a, a big loss but maybe if you're trying to make a more uh, structural language <laughs> analysis that can be a problem um, and the last part if uh, my question was is about if you're i don't know if if you have any uh, intentions to link these two words, um, they are completely unrelated. I mean, the, the, the COVID Chile and the Tijuana is part of a broader migration agenda, I guess, but um, I don't know if you... What, what? Well, I think the importance of the Tijuana project, um, Tercy and I have spoken a lot about is that it really does seem to be filling some sort of gap in the research on injection drug use, um, and particularly among female injection drug users. So I think once that public is published, it um, there will definitely be more it will contribute to in the future, I think, in terms of harm reduction strategies and interventions. Great. Great. Um, we need to continue with the next person, the next practicant to present. Uh, thank you, Alison, for your presentation. And Julian Ponce. There you are. One second. Let me refresh it. I think it's having a little bit of an issue here. No worries, Julian. Uh, take take a second to organize yourself. I wanted to acknowledge Chris, who joined us, um, and I think there's a, a a a few other people that have joined us. Welcome, everybody. Great. Thank you, and I think we're ready now. Um, thanks for your patience. So, hey everyone, my name is Julian Ponce and today I'll be presenting on my summer practicum on the mediating effect of alcohol use, retirement, and mental health in the United States. So why is this an important topic? The world and the U.S. are rapidly aging and many already are and will be entering the retirement transition. This is a stage that might be stressful due to economic, social, and even changes to one's physical health and alcohol consumption is increasing among this age group. Alcohol could be a potential form of self-medication to cope with the stressful transition into retirement. And there are very few studies that focus on this topic, especially among this age group. So understanding the relationship between retirement, alcohol consumption, and mental health outcomes will help us create public policies to support the health 
of older adults and retirees. And an example of a public policy could be like lowering the drinking um, limits for older adults. So the three main research questions for this project are, what is the effect of retirement on depression among older adults? How do individual conditions influence depression? And does alcohol mediate the association between depression and um, retirement and depression? So this is a cross-sectional study focused on older adults ages 62 and older. This is the age where older adults in the United States can start receiving social security benefits. And the data comes from 2016 data from the RAND Health and Retirement Study. This is a longitudinal um, study here in the United States. The variables of interest were identified in the data set and recorded to fit our study. Um, logistic regression was used to examine the association between our predictors and depression, which was recorded into a binary variable. And the Barron and Kenny approach was used for mediation analyses. I'll talk a little bit more about this approach in the following slides. Some of you are probably asking, what is a mediator? And remember, I said a mediator, not a meteor that's gonna strike in 2020. So a mediator is basically a third variable that helps us understand the how or why of a relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. And here I'm showing a model for mediation that I'll be using to demonstrate my analyses in the following slides. So there's four steps to the Barron and Kenny approach. Um, before moving to the following step, you have to see a significant association in the path that you're testing. Um, so keep that in mind as I move forward. If for some reason there wasn't a significant association, we would stop and say that there's no mediation occurring. So in step one, we want to test the path between our independent variable and our outcome variable. In our case, it's retirement and depression. So um, this path does not include the mediator. And in our study, we did see a significant association between retirement and depression, meaning we can move on to step two. In step two, we then test the independent variable retirement to the mediator alcohol consumption. So once again, in our study, we did see a significant association in this path. So we can move on to step three. In step three, we test the path between our mediator alcohol consumption and our outcome variable depression. So once again, we did see a significant association in our study. So we move on to our final step. The final step is to once again test the path between retirement and depression, but this time the model would include alcohol consumption, which is our mediator. So here is our um, fourth measure of association. Once again, we did see a significant association. However, the final step is to compare our last measure of association with our original measure of association. So again, the model that doesn't include the mediator and the model that does include the mediator. So what we're looking for is a difference. If there was a difference between the two, we would say that there's some type of mediation, either full or partial happening. In our case, we didn't see a difference um, in terms of the measure of association with and without um, our mediator. So we can't say that there is mediation happening in this cross-sectional study. Now I'm gonna walk you all through a little bit through our adjusted odd ratios of the logistic regression for depression and highlight some important um, um, findings that we found. So for depression, we recoded this as a yes, no variable based on assessed the eight um, scale of mental health. And for retirement, we recoded this as zero not retired and one retired. Those who are retired self-identified as fully retired or partly retired. And what we saw here is that those who are retired had Higher, um, higher odds of depression compared to those who were not retired. In terms of age, we saw no difference. In terms of gender, we saw that women had higher odds of depression compared to men. In terms of race, we saw no difference. In terms of education levels, we saw that education as a protective factor with those with higher education had lower odds of depression. In terms of marital status, we saw that those who were married had lower odds of depression compared to those who were not married. Now I'm gonna show a little bit more of the predictors. So those who reported any disability had higher odds of depression compared to those who reported no disability. Those who um, reported a subjective health status of good, excellent, or very good had lower odds of depression compared to those who reported poor or fair health. In terms of alcohol consumption, we broke this down into three categories, moderate drinkers, heavy drinkers, and binge drinkers. 
This was based off national guidelines that are different for men and women. Um, so what we found here is that moderate drinkers actually had lower odds of depression. Um, no difference for heavy drinkers. And for binge drinkers, we saw that they had higher odds of depression. So quite a contrast here. So again, just highlighting some of the main results from our study. So those who are retired had higher odds of depression compared to those who were not retired. Protective factors for depression include education level, marriage, and moderate alcohol consumption. Binge drinkers, women, those who reported a disability episode and reported poor or fair health had higher odds of depression. And alcohol did not mediate the association between retirement and depression in our cross-sectional study. So what do these results mean and what are the next steps? So the findings support existing literature on protective and risk factors for depression among older adults. They were very in line with what we're seeing in the literature. However, in terms of alcohol consumption, our study really is adding to the literature given that they're so limited on this age group. Um, and really interesting to see the difference between um, binge drinking and moderate drinking. And the mediation analyses, although we didn't see mediation, this really urges us to explore other variables that can explain the relationship between retirement and depression. It's not like you retire and the next day you're depressed or not. There's really um, other variables that can explain that. So we really need to explore that. And longitudinal studies can help us understand more the temporal relationship between retirement, alcohol consumption, and depression. For example, in this cross-sectional study, it can just tell us if someone is retired or not, but a longitudinal study would give us more of a time frame for that. And preliminary studies in our lab have actually shown that there is mediation in the longitudinal study compared to this cross-sectional study, which again is just one year, one snapshot in time. And before I wrap up, I wanna give a huge thank you to Dr. Antonia Diaz Valdez Iriarte. Thank you for your support, for exposing me to this um, important topic and for motivating me as a first generation student to continue on into a PhD program the Society and Health Research Center for this important research and allowing Columbia students to connect with your country and with your program, the Office of Field Practice for connecting me with this opportunity and um, for supporting me throughout the process, the RAND HRS study for the data and the Columbia University Global Pop Program for your support throughout this process um, and for funding the project as well. So thank you everyone. If you have any questions, I will now take them. Okay, does anyone have any question? I have a question? Yes, Sorry, I can see who's raising their hand, so if you just want to talk. So I just want to thank you for your uh, work and all what you have done. Um, we have discussed about continue this work because this project is within a bigger project. So first we want to do a longitudinal analysis for the US and then we want to compare different countries and again on time. So, and we also have another interest in common which is a study in migration and Latina population in the US. So we will also expand our work to that. And just thank you, Julian, you made an awesome job and we, I hope we continue to work together. Thank you. Julian, can I ask you to stop to share the screen, please? Yes. So we can just see each other better. Right? Yes, that's and great. I have a uh, thank you for your presentation, Julian. I was just wondering if you could talk, did you know how to do this type of analysis or did you learn while doing it? Like what was the definition of mediation? Like, could you just share a little bit of what you learned in the process of the practicum? Yeah, thank you, Teresita. That's a great question. So definitely a lot of learning happening. Um, I was more familiar with SPSS. I had worked briefly with Stata, but more on descriptive statistics. So um, this was definitely like a learning curve to learn how to translate SPSS into Stata. Um, and with the mediation analysis as well, I had learned a little bit about it in EPI, but conducting it and learning about the different methods for mediation and which one is the best to use um, that was definitely like a learning curve as well. But um, I think my next steps for learning are to learn how to conduct longitudinal data. Um, as Professor Antonia Diaz Valdez mentioned, that's kind of where this research is going. And um, I would really like to learn more on how to conduct those kind of analyses. Right. Chris, Chris. Molinari has a question. 
Hi, everybody. Um, thanks, Anna, for the introduction, and I apologize for being late. I'm just coming off of another meeting and webinar. Uh, Julian, thanks you for, for your presentation. I just had a quick question mm -hmm. about the, um, the married group. Do you uh -huh. break that down between people who are widowed and still have their, their um, partner with them? Yeah, for sure. That's a really interesting topic. Um, so in our study, we um, did identify those who were married, those who had a spouse that were absent um, as married, but past literature does point to those who have lost a loved one to have more mental health outcomes. So that could definitely be um, future analyses to break that down and add a variable for those who are widowed and see if there's any difference within that category. I think that would be really interesting. Okay, um, Esteban, do you have a question? Yes, um, thank you, Julian, for your presentation. And, and I have a, just a clarifying question first before I make my question, because maybe I misunderstood something. Yeah. So when you measure alcohol consumption, you're separating people by different drinking categories, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the model, yeah. you treat that variable as a continuous variable or you treat it as, as different categories? Yeah, that's a really great question. So we did um, in both use the categorical variable um, for alcohol consumption and it included men and women. Um, however, we did take into consideration the difference for drinking standards for both. Okay. Um, I, I think, well, this project is asking all the right questions. I, I've done mm -hmm. a bit of research on, on, on retirement and I remember not long ago, I, I was surprised because a lot of people were thinking, well, whether retirement is good or bad to health, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a question that we wouldn't ask about any other life course transition, right? I mean, nobody's asking whether adolescence is good or bad for health, right? Or <laughs> whether beginning a job is good or bad, or it's like under what circumstances is more harmful or, mm -hmm. or less harmful, and for who is easier or harder, mm -hmm. and under what circumstances is, is like kind of the area where I think research has uh, done most of the advances, but still we have a lot to learn about the causal pathways, and, and you're kind of tapping into that, uh, area. And, and I, I wouldn't rush into saying that there is no mediation of consumption because, uh, well, you can measure consumptions in so many different ways, right? So, so maybe uh, that's why I was asking about uh, the categories. So maybe it's only in the comparison between heavy use with, I don't know, lifetime abstaining, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, in the HRS, you cannot measure lifetime, lifetime abstaining for everybody, mm -hmm. which is something that would be great for older adults, because a lot of people who don't drink in old age, it's not because they are super healthy. It's mm -hmm. the opposite. It's because mm -hmm. they drank so much in the past that they had to stop, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so that is, is, is sort of like a, a, a big elephant in the corner in mm -hmm. the HRS, but you can still, you have so many years of information mm -hmm. that you can still track for how many years they have not been drinking. And, 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 and you have a group of people that are clearly lifetime abstainers, and then you can pull them together with people that are just long-term abstainers, mm -hmm. right? So, so I, I would encourage you and Antonia to keep exploring uh, whether there is mediation here and, and the other thing that I've been finding with the HRS and, and, and similar studies in other countries is that most of the health effects of alcohol consumption at the end are explained by smoking, which happens simultaneously with, with alcohol consumption, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so even this debate about the health benefits of moderate drinking mm -hmm. and the end is, the benefit is for just privileged people who do not smoke and drink moderately. Right, that's the bottom line story, right? Uh, so, so I think you're beginning a really interesting agenda of research and, and, and there are a lot of other questions to ask. And, and, and I'm remembering uh, a, a colleague of us at Columbia, Catherine Keyes, she has a number of papers in, in which she is finding, she's not looking at the health effects, but, but at the consumption patterns. And she's seeing a spike in consumption around retirement. So it's very important to look what's happening around those times, but it apparently decreases uh, a year or two years after retirement. So maybe also focusing on short-term effects mm -hmm. is something that will allow you to see whether, whether there is a story or not here, right? Because maybe people are 
like over drinking uh, right after the retirement because they have more time or because they, I don't know, they are adjusting, but then they go back to normal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so those are just a few ideas, but, but I think this is like, uh, this is the right way to go. I, I would be happy to see how this uh, moves forward and then finds uh, new results and conducts sensitivity analysis. Uh, so congratulations, Actually, and thank you. All, all you mentioned is in our literature review and we have conducted some preliminary analysis longitudinally, and we are finding that the smoke effect, the, well, all what you mentioned. We haven't explored in detail the widow category, mm -hmm. but we will. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Alison, I think she has a question. Um, yeah, this is somewhat related. I was wondering why, do you have any idea of why moderate alcohol consumption might lead to less depression? Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and there's many explanations too that I can point to. Um, one is like the social connectedness of drinking. So for a lot of older adults, they face like loneliness, right? And maybe like drinking alcohol is a place where they socialize with others and have that social support. And I know there's some other research that points to like biological factors. Obviously alcohol affects your um, body in many ways and there are some studies that have pointed to like you know better health outcomes due to that however I think they're like really well widely debated and like tons of factors such as like smoking and whatnot that do affect that outcome so something to be um, looked into a little bit more I think something really interesting as well is the effect that alcohol consumption has on older adults so a lot of like national guidelines have the same guidelines for adults and older adults so you know i'm considered an adult 25 and i have the same um guidelines as someone who's 75 right whereas um a lot of the literature shows us that older adults um are more susceptible to the effects of alcohol like one drink for an older adult um might affect them more than one drink to a younger adult right so i think those are all factors to keep in mind as we continue this work Okay, should we continue with the next presentation? Okay, Christina and Thomas. There you are. Thank you. Yep, now is everyone seeing the presenter view or the full screen? Presenter view. Presenter view, it always happens. Okay, how's this going? Now you're full screen. Awesome. Great, Christina, you wanna just kick it off? Sure, so we were working under Alvaro Castillo and Abraham. We were looking at the effects of the 2019 social protests on health service utilization in Santiago, Chile. So in October, as many of you most likely know, Chile went into a very large social weakening and we were examining how these affected ER admissions during that time. Would you like to move forward? Yep. Okay, so um, so here's the overview of our project aim. Um, basically, I try not to read so much off the slide, but our study wanted to quantify the effects of the October 2019 protest on health services utilization in the Santiago metropolitan region. Um, we did this in terms of physical injury and respiratory complications. Um, using emergency consultation and hospitalization data as a proxy measure. Um, in doing this, we decided to try to demonstrate this through the use of a controlled interrupted time series analysis, which we'll talk about more in future slides. Um, basically using emergency consultation and hospitalization data to determine if there are any shifts in health services utilization around this time period. Okay. So let's give everyone a, a quick background of what's going on here. Um, so first I'll talk a little bit about the definition of a social movement. Um, I'm sure many of us are familiar with it, but just to reiterate, social movements are organized efforts by a group or groups of people working towards a common goal. Um, and typically they do this through joint action or effort against some sort of antagonist. Um, and then if we look at civil unrest, civil unrest is actually during times of social movements, but this occurs when participants in the movement intentionally cause a public disturbance that 
may uh, violate the law. Um, examples of this are hostility towards authority and participants may engage in violent or destructive actions that can uh, have significant direct and indirect health effects on the local populations. Um, and of course, to mention during civil unrest, there are, of course, many uh, concerns with um, like law enforcement during this time as well. Um, and so when we're talking about the health effects of civil unrest, uh, we typically can divide them into direct and indirect health effects. Uh, what we have listed here are uh, the direct health effects. Um, we have more trauma and respiratory health effects. And these, these are kind of the two criteria that we're gonna be looking at in our study. Um, so under trauma, uh, two of the main ones are, are rubber bullets, your use of kinetic impact projectiles. Um, there's actually a study that just came out this month uh, that looked at uh, the use of kinetic impact project projectiles during the Chilean protest, and they found um, significant numbers of, of eye injuries, among others. Um, other injuries can include lacerations and hematomas as well. Um, as far as physical injury go, this is, this is a very broad category, but this includes any other sort of uh, trauma-related injury that can occur during protests. This would be burns, contusions, fractures, uh, among other things. Um, and then if we move to respiratory injuries, what we typically hear of and what we'd focus on in, in these types of injuries would be the use of tear gases. Um, tear gases, as far as we know from our, our literature review, uh, have a variety of possible short-term, long-term effects. Um, short-term effects can include coughing, wheezing, uh, constriction of your air tubes and acute respiratory arrest. Um, long-term effects can include more long-term obstructive pulmonary diseases, chronic bronchitis, um, and then just persistent symptoms like this coughing and wheezing that, that seem to continue for longer than we would expect. Um, and so one last thing to note here uh, that is relevant to our study is that we know, as far as our literature review goes, we know a little bit about the direct health effects. We at least know like, what rubber bullets cause. We know uh, the possible short-term, long-term effects of tear gas and other physical injuries. Uh, we also know a little bit about the indirect effects of, um, of social movements and civil unrest, such as the shutdown of city streets, disruption of public transportation that we, we did see in, in Chile. Um, and these things can lead to deteriorations of hygiene conditions, uh, disruption of basic services and food insecurity. Um, but interestingly, and this is where our paper comes in, we don't actually fully understand how movements like this and large scale population level events affect the utilization of healthcare services. Um, and so this is, this is where our project goes in. Uh, but Christina will talk a little bit more about uh, background to put this into context. So as well, social movements, civil unrest, they're not unique to any country border or culture. Um, a lot of these are global movements that are truly rooted in human rights advocacy. Uh, in the US, we saw the rise of Black Lives Matter protests with the death of George Floyd. Uh, in France, we saw due to the increased cost of living the Yellow Vest movement, and in Hong Kong, we saw protests against an extradition bill that could endanger those seen as political dissidents. Therefore, our, our research really has overarching themes that affect almost every inch of this world. Next, Tommy. For some context into the Chilean historical context of the protests, the October protests were multifaceted, but they had several prominent causes. Um, one of the main chants emphasized that it wasn't the 30 peso increase in the metro fair, but it was rather 30 years of injustices against the Chilean people. Uh, first, we look at income inequalities. Um, it is lifted the richest of the rich, hindered the poorest of the poor. As you can see, the richest 1% of the Chilean population earns 33% of the nation's wealth. Uh, second, we focus on constitutional rights. So as a current constitution was drafted, under Pinochet's military regime, we don't necessarily see the human rights protections that many of the protesters are currently demanding. 
Um, that's why a lot of protesters want a complete overhaul of the Constitution. Third, we look at stagnant wages, rising debt, insufficient social services. This really ties back and strengthens the income inequalities. And fourth, we look at the corruption within the government and within the prison system. Uh, imprisoned protesters from the October protests reported sexual and physical assault once imprisoned uh, for protest crimes. Next, Tommy. Here's just a brief timeline of the protests. So we begin with the institution of the Metro Fair hike on October 6th. And from then to around October 17th, there were sporadic protests, small demonstrations, but the mass protests that our study uses as our intervention began on October 18th. So there were more than 1.2 million protesters in Santiago alone. 55% of Chileans supported the continuation of the protests. Um, in terms of government response, carabineros utilized anti-riot shotguns, rubber bullets, physical force, and tear gas as a means of crowd control. So thousands were injured, and as Tommy mentioned, uh, a lot of people presented with serious eye injuries. And protests continued throughout the end of the year. And for context, uh, within just one month, October 18th to November 22nd, Chilean Medical Services treated over 11,000 injuries. Next, Tommy. Okay, so, so looking at our, uh, our analysis, what did we do? Um, basically, we first looked at uh, publicly available data from the Chilean Ministry of Health, and we, we took this data, cleaned it up, and basically isolated it to, and refined it into um, our study criteria, which I'll actually talk about uh, in the next slide um, to give you some, some more details on that. Um, once we identified our study criteria, we performed an interrupted time series analysis. Um, and so what we did is we used a negative binomial regression model, uh, which allows for uh, looking at count data of over dispersed data. Um, and what we did is we fit this to our exposure period from 2015 to 2018. So quickly, our pre-exposure period in, in this case was August 1st to October 17th. We wanted to give a few months in advance to look at daily data from there. Um, so we fitted our pre-exposure data from 2015 to 2018 um, to our model. And then what we did was we forecasted uh, daily case numbers, uh, both consultations and hospitalizations for 2019. Um, in, a, in a sense, what we did is we tried to predict what would have happened in the absence of the October social protests. Um, and then what we did after we, we got our, our daily numbers and our, our forecasts, we performed tests as our mean comparison analysis. Um, so what we did is we looked at our post-exposure period, which again, I'll, I'll reiterate, but it's uh, the start of the intervention, October 18th, until for the sake of our study, December 31st, 2019. So what we did is we took the, the average of all the daily numbers um, in the post-exposure period uh, and compared that average for actual cases versus predicted cases, and then saw if there was a difference in that. Um, and then lastly, what we did was we, we calculated uh, seven day moving averages of both actual and predicted cases to compare. And then we also created cumulative difference graphs, um, which you will be seeing in a few slides as well. So uh, just to give everyone a little more information about our study criteria and some definitions that, that we uh, implemented into our project. Um, as mentioned before, the pre-exposure period was August 1st to October 17th. Our post-exposure period was October 18th to December 31st. Our intervention was, of course, uh, at the onset of the social protest beginning on October 18th, 2019. Um, our main outcomes for this study, we were looking at trauma and respiratory consultations and hospitalizations. So we basically had four main outcomes we were looking at. Um, 
And then what we did is when we were taking the data, we isolated it um, to the age range of 15 to 64 years, because as we found in our literature review, uh, a majority of uh, participants in these protests were, I think, around the age of 30, so within this age range. Um, and then lastly, what we did was we narrowed our window to uh, hospitals within one kilometer and then hospitals within three kilometers of Plaza Bacadano, which was the protest focal point in Santiago. Um, the goal of narrowing our geographic boundaries uh, was that if we could basically get closer to the focal point of the protest, we hoped that we could isolate any potential effects of the protests. Okay, so we're moving on to results. Uh, so for the sake of this presentation, I'm only providing graphs uh, within one kilometer rather than within three kilometers. Um, and so what we're looking at here are, uh, on the left side, we see actual versus predicted case numbers, and this is all for tr daily trauma cases. So we have actual cases in blue, predicted cases in, um, I'm colorblind, I apologize, it looks yellow to me. Uh, <laughs> um, but we're comparing here. And so we do see here that actually in the pre-exposure period from August to October 18th, we see a very similar trend and then it seems to break a little bit and we actually have, uh, it looks like reductions in actual cases following October 18th. Um, and what this shows here is one of our main results was that trauma consultations were actually 20% lower than predicted um, following the onset of October 18th protests. Um, and then when we look at trauma hospital hospitalizations, um, we actually found that trauma hospitalizations were 30% higher than predicted um, following the onset of the protests. Uh, and then when we look at the cumulative difference graphs, um, this is just a, another way to visualize this. So we see a fairly steady. This means that uh, our model uh, fits pretty well to the pre-exposure period. And then we see uh, steady declines in the cumulative difference after. And then the same thing with hospitalizations, we see this increase. Um, and now if we move on to respiratory cases, uh, we have the same set of figures. Um, but interestingly, we see, we see this big difference in our respiratory consultations uh, within one kilometer. So our results show that respiratory consul consultations were 9% higher than predicted in the post-exposure period. But the issue here with our analysis is that uh, our predictions actually very much underestimated the pre-exposure period. Um, I think of note for, for this period of time and for consultations, the cumulative difference graph may, be, uh, may provide more insight um, because we do see rap like significant increases in cumulative difference, but then it actually seems to plateau here. Um, and so we do see a relative decrease in post-exposure respiratory consultations compared to the pre-exposure period. Uh, and of course, this is, this is actually one of the things we're, we're talking about analyzing later. Um, and then when we get to respiratory hospitalizations, uh, we found non-significant increases um, as well, 25% higher. Um, but interestingly, uh, in our three kilometer group, both respiratory consultations and respiratory hospitalizations uh, showed significant differences from the predicted values. All right. And moving on to our discussion, uh, as Tommy mentioned earlier, we have to discuss the changes in patient utilization. So as we saw in the results, um, consultations generally decreased and hospitalizations increased. And one of the thing, key points we were talking about was it could be surmised that during these times of peak protests, uh, possible violence, individuals who would normally visit the ED would avoid doing so unless absolutely necessary. And it would alter the health seeking behaviors of our population in a reduction in overall emergency utilization, but an increase in severity of the cases that are presented to the hospital. Um, and then Tommy touched upon this very well in the introduction. There are severe gaps of knowledge in the literature uh, most social movement focused literature focuses really on indirect health effects and mental health um, of those who participate in the protests or those who are affected by it.
but um, they don't necessarily address common crowd control measures and health effects or patient utilization. But if we were able to demonstrate evidence through our project of severe health effects, increased severe hospitalizations during times of peak protest, we could use this information to advocate for, advise policy change in terms of government response and crowd control methods. Tony, mm -hmm. in terms of our project next steps, there are some more tests of significance, some more strategies we'd like to look at in terms to analyze our data. Um, we have to discuss our results, limitations, complete the writing of the paper, review, edit, revise as necessary, and then submit to journals. Thank you for your time. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Thank you for your presentation. And uh, can you stop like sharing the screen so we can see each other? Thank you. Does anyone have any question? Ah, uh, Esteban, go ahead. Um, maybe you're aware, but a couple of days ago, there was a paper published in Nature that was looking at uh, ocular trauma uh, mm -hmm. connected to these projectiles and, and it was very descriptive. So what you're doing is, is like, a, I think, a, a step forward. But, but if you haven't seen that paper, um, it really literally came out two days ago. And um, I, I love this project because sometimes I think that science is power. And, and this is one of those cases because the use of these rubber bullets have been increasing as a method of crowd control. In Chile, it has been like, just massively used in, and although it's a non-lethal weapon, they can so easily slip into police brutality that, that this is a kind of results that we need to hear, you know, rubber bullets should be avoided as a method of crowd control or limited, regulated, you know, because they can lead into more hospitalizations. Uh, so sometimes science needs to demonstrate what common sense <laughs> you can see this from common sense, but you have to say these and, and, and just not publish it. I mean, do publish it, but also put it in the media. You know, this is the kind of results that the authorities need to, need to see. And, and this is like the best kind of public health research when you say something that literally changes the world. So congratulations on that. And I have two questions for you. One is, why do you think that you see so much variability in, in uh, consultations and hospitalizations over time, because I, I was like, there's this time trend that changes so much and, and are there seasonal effects? I don't know what's going on. You know, you, you already smooth the trends by, by using a seven day average. So that, that was a first thing that surprised me. Another thing that surprised me uh, was that you were finding an increase in consultations and an increase in hospitalizations, right? And, and I wonder how do you make sense of that? So, so I can talk to the, the first question. So um, this was actually one of the, the most challenging parts of taking daily data values and trying to create an analysis based on this. Um, I apologize for the noise in the background if you can hear it. Um, but uh, basically, uh, and the way we think about this is that like, Daily from day to day, there is so much variation who shows up and who doesn't show up. Um, so that was a, a big challenge, but we, we did see a lot of seasonal variation. And this was something that was a challenge in creating our models um, and being able to, to match them to multiple different uh, outcomes. And so uh, we found, um, I apologize, is it really loud right now in the background? We can still hear you. Okay. Um, I don't know what's going on. Um, but we did see, uh, especially uh, in respiratory outcomes, we see a big seasonal change. Um, we see, uh, sorry, I don't know what's going on. We see a big seasonal change. Um, we see peaks in the summer months, um, or I guess it's winter months in, in Chile. Uh, and then we see uh, obviously big declines um, in the summer months in Chile. Uh, we also did see, um, and trauma is an example of this, we saw weekly, weekly trends and seasonality. So we did see um, increases in um, kind of moving towards, uh, moving towards the weekend and then actually drops off on about a Sunday and then 
uh, kind of building back up throughout the week. So, so these were things that we really had to take into account. But um, along with that point, there's just so much variation day to day that it does make the, the graphs extremely, um, extremely uh, difficult to understand unless we really smooth it out. And in terms of the second question, in terms of the differences between consultations and hospitalizations, of course, in the beginning, we thought that there might be, of course, an obvious rise in both of them. But when you really look at the factors of what's happening during the protests, uh, people who would normally be going to the hospital for something very minor in terms of the ED consultations, they wouldn't be anymore. There's also a lot of outside factors during the protests. Um, there were doctors in the streets who were treating minor injuries. Um, I think it, I think in one article I read, they had treated over 500 patients during the times of the protest. As well, there were a lot of arrests. So people who may have been facing violence during the time of the protest may never have even made it to the hospital. So um, we thought that from this, most likely the overall consultations may have decreased, but those who did present to the hospital were severe enough to present to the hospital and they would have been hospitalized. And that's why our hospitalizations in general went up. Does that answer your question? Yep. Um, one, more, yeah, one more thing to note on that too, um, and this was one of the, the challenges of our paper, was that pulling public data uh, from the, the government databases uh, got complicated in, in the sense that uh, private institutions didn't necessarily have to put all their data or didn't for, for whatever reason. Um, so we actually had to limit it to, to public hospitals. And then even within the, the hospitals that did submit data, there was a lot, of, a lot of institutions that would just be completely missing data for one or two months. Um, so we really had to narrow the window of that. Um, so it'd be interesting if we could gain access to, to some of the private institutions and, and continue on. Great. Any other question? I, I don't have a question. Uh, I, I just wanted to say a couple of things and I, I need to leave soon. So I don't know if I can take one or two minutes. Um, so I'm Tanya, I'm the director for the Global and Population Health Program at the VPNS, uh, so the medical school. And I just wanted to really, really thank uh, all of you you know, the site and the mentors uh, who actually, you know, this has been a really, really tricky year for everything, but in particular for our program, because we had 42 students scheduled to go abroad, and that included Tommy and Julian. And, you know, projects had to be reconfigured with different levels of success. And, you know, we've had a chance to review the work and we're really, really pleased with what Tommy and Julian were able to accomplish. So just wanted to really give a, you know, a shout out um, to all of you. Wanted also to thank Ana Jimenez because she served as a bridge. This is the first time our program works with your site. Uh, I'm from Venezuela. I've lived in many places in Latin America and I really, really would like to see the program uh, developing stronger bonds with sites uh, in the region. So this was really, really a fantastic opportunity that I'm happy we didn't have to miss because of the pandemic. So I um, wanted to invite you all for the fall symposium. So what we do every year, we organize um, with all the student projects a symposium. This year, of course, is gonna be virtual. Um, you're all welcome. I'm going to share the invite with Anna so that she can share it with you. Um, we're going to have a panel of mentors talking about global health research in times of COVID-19 because we want to, you know, address uh, somehow what happened. We want to hear what worked and what didn't work. And then uh, students are going to have their own individual Zoom uh, sessions. So there's going to be space for students to benefit from hearing from Julian and, and Tommy's work. We're going to launch a website a week prior to the event where their work is going to be uh, showcased. So we're going to share that with you too. So just sorry to sort of interrupt, but I just wanted to make sure uh, to acknowledge all of you. And Dr. Calvo, I know 
Dr. Schluger, who uh, has been, you know, the director of the program, has uh, knows you well, or he knows your work, and he was really enthusiastic about this partnership. He's now left Colombia, so I'm more on my own, but, um, but I look forward to continue the cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Tania. Thank you. Any other question before I can... Alvaro. Sorry, I don't have a question. It's just uh, <laughs> if there's other questions, um, this is my final comment. If, you, if there are other questions, please I don't know, raise your hand. Yes, no? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just want to, to, to close and first recognize and thank Christine and Tommy's work. They have done a tremendous work and they both are very, very responsible, capable, and I'm very happy to work with them. And they already express their interest in keep working in this paper. So we have the of, of, of course, finishing the paper, submitting, and hopefully publishing soon. <laughs> and also want to thank um, Abraham. Abraham is, is a, a um, PhD student at the University of Chile, and he came up with the first idea of this project. So he's been working with us. We're meeting the four of us during this, um, this, during this practicum. And, and he's an ER uh, doctor, so he has provided for many, many of the, the more insights of the actual clinical work there students, no, the, 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 the hospitals do during this process. So thank you also to Abraham. And, and yeah, and of course you saw preliminary results. I think they're not going to change dramatically, probably, but of course there are many things we can do next in terms of um, the, the analysis itself, some data management. Of course, we face many, many issues during the, the during the, the, the work uh, uh, Thomas and Christina did, and that includes the, the lack of data of pri private hospitals or clinics. And there are a few clinics that are near to the focal point mentioned that sadly we don't have any data, but I think still we can show uh, some of these uh, short term effects on health utilization uh, associated with the, 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 the social protests. And, and well, that's basically what, it, and, and we did saw the paper and, and of course we will be part of our discussion, our introduction, and I think they make a very, very good cases. Actually, our first hypothesis was this uh, was, uh, our hypothesis was oh, we are going to see an increase in trauma consultations in these closed hospitals. But then we tried to explain our results, the decrease in consultations, and they're basically, they actually do make sense um, because many of the uh, injuries were treated in the epiquetes or in these like, um, medical assistant places like in place of the social protest. So they're probably, we, the hospitals receive only the most, uh, uh, the most severe cases and that can explain, for example, the hospitalization that increased. And, and the less severe cases, well, it's reasonable they decrease because they have very difficult to access to the health services. So um, I don't know, still we are thinking and I don't know, but I think we are going in a in a good direction, and thank you again and to for your questions and and for the work Thomas and Christina did. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we are going now to the last presentation. Elena, are you ready? There you are. Um, okay. So um, I did my practicum on measures of social isolation and loneliness in older adults. Um, and I'm studying epidemiology and I'm getting my certificate in health of an aging society. Uh, 
So I have experience with older adults um, and programs that combat social isolation and loneliness. And I was interested in learning more about the research behind this. So I worked with Dr. Calvo, who has been developing a longitudinal data set for about 200,000 individuals, 50 and over, and who are observed repeatedly in six surveys in 23 countries. And my, my project added information on social connectedness, social isolation, and loneliness. And my goals were to analyze this these different measures um, and to document their availability, validity, and reliability among older adults. Um, so the first thing that I did was a literature review. So I looked to see what research has been done on social isolation and loneliness. Um, and then I defined these terms and differentiated between them. I selected some key studies to review more in depth, and I looked at specific studies on measurements of social isolation and loneliness to determine which measures were validated and which would be best to use. Then I reviewed the, I, after I selected these measures, I looked through the longitudinal studies to see which, which ones have asked these specific questions. Um, and then, I, the last step that was, I started to prepare the data from the studies for comparison in SAS, and I ended up looking at six different surveys and four indicators that I'll get to. Um, and this was something that I had created that helped me to better understand and visualize all the different terms. Um, one of the sources that I had read mentioned that social connectedness was an umbrella term. Um, so I kind of drew that out. And social connectedness is the extent to which one has meaningful, close, and constructive relationships with others. And it's composed of structure, function, and quality. And the structure of social connectedness was social isolation, which is a complete or near complete lack of contact with society. And the function of social connectedness was social support, which is actual or perceived availability of resources from others. And then the last one was quality, which is uh, like a positive or negative experience, and that's loneliness, um, which is the perception of social isolation. Um, so for my literature review, I used EndNote, and I ended up with a total of 205 references, 154 on loneliness, 144 on social isolation, 42 were broad reviews, and 27 were specific on measurements. Um, and there was some overlap between those studies. So, and talking more about social isolation, there were a few different um, ways of measuring it. And this is one that I selected. It was the Berkman and Sims Social Network Index. And it looks at these four domains for measuring social isolation, which were marriage or partnerships, family and friends, church or religious group participation, and club or any group participation. Um, and then after deciding on this measure, I then looked at the longitudinal studies to see which included the questions in their surveys. And I found that these I think eight um, studies included the questions on social isolation. And then I prepared the data for harmonization and I pulled out um, the answers to these questions. Um, and then just to look a little bit more at social isolation, um, so this was for one study, which is a share study that looks at Europe, and one wave, which is the most recent year that the data was available for, um, looking at group or community participation. Um, and for that measure, you can see for Denmark, um, people were more likely to say that they had participated in a group project, so they're less likely to be socially isolated. Um, and then we can also compare that to um, scores of loneliness scores, which are um, measured using the UCLA loneliness scale. Um, and those are for the entire study, but you can see that Denmark has a lower mean loneliness score, so people are less likely to be lonely. And also we can see from the beginnings of my research that, they're big, that it shows that they are less likely to be socially isolated. And then we can see Greece, people in Greece are more likely to be lonely, and it looks like they are possibly more likely to be socially isolated also. Um, for my findings, uh, I found that loneliness 
um, is using the UCLA loneliness scale as the gold standard, and it's included in many longitudinal and cross-national studies. But in contrast, there's no gold standard for social isolation. Um, the Berkman and Sim Social Network Index is a good start, but it needs to be better refined. Um, there are a few different ways of measuring it, and there's no um, uniform way of scoring. Um, and then another way of measuring social isolation is the Love and Social Network scale, which is used for older adults, um, but it's not commonly used in these surveys. So for the next steps, um, it's to continue extracting these selected measures on social isolation and to prepare them for harmonization. Then the final goal is to have the harmonized data that compares these measures um, across different countries. Uh, and I'd also be curious to see how COVID has changed any of this. Um, many of the studies that are doing, um, doing their questionnaires now have added sections specific about COVID and people's experience with COVID. Um, so yeah, so thank you to everyone who's been a part of this and I'm looking for any questions. Great. Thank you. Can you stop sharing the screen, please? Thanks. Does anyone have any question? Daniel? Okay. Uh, thanks, Alana, for the, the great work and the presentation. I'm excited to see this, this project coming along. Um, to, to everyone else who may be wondering what, what I'm doing here, who this guy is, uh, I, uh, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology uh, and at the Columbia Aging Center, and I direct the Certificate of an Aging Society Fellowship uh, or Certificate Program and the Longevity Fellowship. So I'm here in particular um, to, to see the work that uh, Alana and Esteban have, have been working on uh, over the course of the summer. Um, this task of um, measurement harmonization across all these studies is, you know, not always the most exciting thing to look at, but it's tremendously important uh, in generating these powerful cross-national comparisons that Alana is, is starting to work toward and that Esteban has done a lot of in, in his own work. So we're really excited um, to, to see the development of this kind of a cross-national database to investigate how uh, patterns of loneliness and social isolation vary across countries and respond to different kinds of social policy interventions. Um, the question that I wanted to ask, so I will get to that, uh, is in the graph that you showed, there was a lot of missing data. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what that meant or, 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 or why it was there. Yeah, so there is a lot of missing data with this. Um, and it's partially because for that question in particular, it was a combination of three questions to just get at that one question. Um, so if any of that information was missing, like someone didn't answer it or refused to answer it, then it's missing. Um, but also for some of these surveys that the questions for these questions were on a specific section of the survey and not everyone completed that. So that's why that's there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm happy to talk more about this project uh, down the road. I'm sure we'll have uh, many more conversations in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Um, Alvaro? Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'm wondering if, you, do you see that it's feasible in the short term at least to use this data to, or I'm wondering how, what could be the, I don't know, impact effect or whatever of the COVID pandemic <laughs> on this, of course, there is a very obvious and apparently direct link between loneliness and COVID. We are mm -hmm. basically <laughs> uh, isolated in our, in our houses, and and that of course will be it can have a negative effect in people who are living alone, for example. But uh, I'm wondering how this, uh, how can you translate? this study data, or how would you study this in the context of COVID? Thinking that maybe the, there might be a delay in data generation from the surveys, maybe there's not that the best sources. Are you planning in the near future to use other sources of data? 
collect your own data? I don't know. Um, yeah. So there, I know that there's a survey right now going on that's asking people in different countries about their experiences before COVID and during COVID with loneliness and social isolation. Um, but that's d being done online. So anyone who has access to that survey, it's just, it's like a select group of people. So that like, there are some issues with how they're collecting the data, but I know that some of these more, the longitudinal studies have added these sections um, that again are, are asking specifically to compare it, what, what it was like before with what it's like now, but they used to do a lot of this in person. So I'm not exactly sure how they're doing it, but there probably will be differences with that. Any other question? Uh, Antonia? Yeah, uh, we, I think we just saw a descriptive analysis. I wonder if you work on preliminary results or some kind of model, or if you're thinking to do that, and uh, what do you uh, find to be significant or related to loneliness in older adults in the literature review? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so still working on getting all the data together. Um, but it was interesting that there were some differences found um, in loneliness in different countries based on these surveys. Um, that some areas found people, like even within Europe, there were studies that were saying like Northern Europe is different from Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, and being able to compare that and then looking and seeing why that might be, if there's something about the society that causes it or it's just how the people are. Um, yeah. It's done. So um, when you do cross national research, there is always, unfortunately, a, a trade off between depth and breadth, right? So the more countries you include, the less nuanced are the measure, measurements that you get, right? And, and therefore we haven't done much modeling and, and, and we're taking these like step by step. Um, I think Ilana's work was great to have an overview about the field because uh, this has, turned into, very quickly turned into sort of like a sexy field that is receiving a lot of funding and it has become even more important with the pandemic, right? Uh, but there is a lot of conceptual ambiguity, right? And um, there are two ways to go, right? So what measurements do we have available? And then what can we do with that? And this way, well, this time we didn't start in that way. We, we basically mapped out um, the full breadth on the, of the concepts and the measurements that are traditionally used. And then we went and see what can we done with the surveys that we're using, right? So these conceptual figure, this umbrella that Ilana showed, I think is brilliant, you know? It, it really helps us to see the big picture and understand uh, all the concepts and, 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 and what can we measure at different, different levels, right? And we won't be able to measure everything. We have a good measurement of loneliness, which is widely accepted. Uh, we will be able to measure social isolation. And it was really nice to see that, that the scales that um, are available have been created by my former mentors. So <laughs> this is like kind of emotional to me. Um, but we still have to see uh, we have to deal with a lot of problems. So Dan was asking about missing data, for example. And it seems to be a simple question, you know, but it's not that easy to answer it. Uh, because these surveys are so complicated that understanding, just understanding who was supposed to answer that question is not trivial uh, when you have like 20 something countries, right? Uh, so missing data can be reported in, in, in multiple ways. And, and we have done some improvements to, to estimate what is like a true missing data versus uh, just a, a missing data point that 
should not have had information there, right? Uh, but investing this time in preparing data of good quality, I think is a great opportunity to, to do research on loneliness and to understand the health effects, the health consequences of loneliness. And Alvaro, you were asking about, uh, well, what do we plan to do uh, in relation to the pandemic and, and whether we have any data uh, that could allow us to, to identify some effects. Uh, so, so far we have not looked at any of the data, like the post-pandemic data. Uh, the service continued. They released new data like a month ago that most likely was collected in a very different way than it was before. We don't know how many people answered that. Um, so we still have to check that. But in theory, there is a gigantic opportunity here. And, and this is the kind of things that I would like to continue doing with Alana and with people like Dan at the uh, Columbia Aging Center. Um, the pandemic basically introduced like a natural experiment in loneliness, right? Loneliness is not randomly distributed uh, across individuals, right? Like any other social determinant of health, particular people have more of it or less of it, right? But the pandemic basically introduced some variation in loneliness that is exogenous to our decision-making, to our characteristics, is not perfect like any naturally or socially induced experiment. But basically, like in Chile, we were forced to stay in lockdown uh, for a long time, right? So that increases our social, well, in theory, increases our social isolation and, and, and loneliness. And I think there, there is a big opportunity to identify causal effects of loneliness on health. But we have to see uh, the quality of the data uh, after the pandemic, uh, how many people answer those surveys. So, so we still like, there is a big opportunity, but we are still working on, on, on just improving uh, the quality of the data. And Ilana did a fantastic job uh, in launching this initiative. And, and she has been working together with Jose, who's also in, in this uh, 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 um, Zoom meeting. Um, so we hope to continue. Um, now we have a clear idea of what measures were available before the pandemic. We have begun harmonizing them and we need to see how much uh, information we can get after the pandemic. And if we can get a lot, I think there is a lot of potential uh, to do good causally oriented research here. Okay, great. I think we are we have a time here. So thank you all for the your presentations. They were great. And Anna, if you want to say something like to finish the Zoom. Yes, I have the nice closing opportunity. And since we are a little over time, I will be briefer than I was planning. But my first real applause and thank you is to the students. You all have done such a wonderful job and are such wonderful representatives of scholarship at Melman. Um, we are very proud also of the way that you've been able to show your commitment and to come up even with uh, creative ideas like showing what I consider a conceptual model, Ilana, with that umbrella. Uh, and uh, doing such a tremendous job, each one of you, uh, in working with different kinds of topics, but really uh, making research and making good scholarship possible remotely. And the next applause and the next big thank you is really for each of the supervisors and also for the doctoral students that worked with you, for everyone. And I'm sorry, I'm not um, mentioning everyone by name because of time, but thank you from the heart. And um, thank you to both uh, Cynthia and Rosario for coordinating uh, this. And thank you to the Global Center and to the Aging Center for supporting 
uh, parts or whole of this. Thank you to Global Pop. And uh, last but not least, thank you to Universidad Mayor and particularly Esteban. Um, you are such a jewel, such a collaborative and easy to work with leader that uh, we are so fortunate to have you uh, and count on you. We really hope that this program expands. We hope to see some publications, and so we hope to see these relationships uh, that have started continue. We have seen publications already from prior students and participations in conferences, but we hope that this cohort won't be any different. And we really hope that we can expand this collaboration through the years and have more professional exchanges and visits once the pandemic lifts the uh, imposition. And the students were invited already by Esteban, but I just want to reiterate that everyone is welcome in Chile when travel is again a possibility. And everyone in Chile is welcome here when travel is again a possibility too. And so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. The feeling is mutual. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.